Okay, we should be all set. Hello, everybody. Welcome to another social distance learning brought to you by the Liberal Gun Club. We don't have a bench doctor tonight. Scott is off for the evening. Tonight, we have Deviant Alam, and he's going to talk about firearms and flying. This is currently being streamed out of Zoom to Twitch, Twitter, and Facebook. Typically, we're handling firearms during the streaming event, and YouTube doesn't like that. So it's not streaming out there, but this will end up on YouTube at a later date. So everyone knows, all participants, but the moderators and presenter have their video shut off and are muted. If there are questions, please put them in the Discord Q&A channel or inside the Zoom chat. We have several people that watch for those questions so that we can compile them into a document and ask them at the end. Uh, but the easiest way to get your an question answered is to become a member and sign into Zoom so you can ask your question live in chat. Becoming a member is inexpensive, it's only about $10 a year, and brings other benefits with it, like being a part of a CMP-affiliated club. After this, we normally hop over into Discord, where we chat in video and audio fashion. Uh, we call these our post-SDL shenanigans. I put the link to Discord in the participant chat, so feel free to click on that and join us there. And now, take it away. All right. How is everyone tonight? I hope that I hope this will be useful. I hope this will be rewarding. It's a topic that touches on a lot of our lives. Uh, many people do travel with firearms. I've been lecturing about flying with firearms for a very, very long time. In fact, uh, some of you may have seen on my site or elsewhere that this has been like a series of slides and videos that whew, they're, they're a decade old at this point. And they could use a refresh. And I was really grateful for the opportunity for LGC to invite me. And I spent, must've been two days straight, just going through footage and photos and notes of which I have been gathering a ton. So as you heard, I'm Devian Olaf and I fly with guns. I fly with guns a lot, actually. So I put up probably about a hundred flights a year as an average bit of miles. And yeah, for, as I said, over well over a decade now, I have been diligently like flying with a gun, even if I didn't need a gun, just because I enjoy exercising that privilege. I make sure that it's something that airports are accustomed to seeing travelers with their firearms. I think it's a healthy thing for society and it allows me to answer a lot of questions that you all might have. Starting with, you know, how does this work? Like you say you fly a lot. So like, yeah, I, I literally, I, I fly a ton. I have flown into and out of pretty much every airport you've ever heard of and then some. Uh, my luggage, if you've ever seen pictures of me you know, in airports, you're gonna see kind of these Pelican cases typically because hard-sided cases are a thing that will be involved in flying with firearms. And as I said, it's, it's almost all 50 states. In fact, we'll, we'll make it a little interactive. Uh, if anyone's monitoring the chat, can anyone guess? That there's one state uh, that it is not possible to fly into and out of with firearms. Anyone guess which state it is? I'll look at the chat as well here. Let's see, New, everyone, uh, everyone New guesses York. New York, Hawaii. Those are really solid guesses. Uh, no, it's not New York. I have personally flown into and out of New York, including both airports in New York City. Uh, this is Officer Solomon of the Port Authority, Matt, like very, very much handling my firearms and writing stuff down. And uh, this has been clarified in letters, the safe passage provision of the Firearm Owners Protection Act of 86. It applies to air travel. You know, if you're transiting through New York City, uh, remember you, <laughs> let me be very clear about this. You did not stay in New York City with your firearms, right? You came from a place outside of the city, you got to the city and you got to the airport directly. Uh, that is the rule. You did not stick around. You did not have a meal. You didn't go to Junior's for cheesecake or, you know, Grimaldi's for pizza or something. You went straight to the airport. So that is possible. Uh, no, it is, to sit, let me see, check the chat again, see if anyone else has figured it out by now. Hawaii, Maine, or Alaska? No, the answer, the answer in fact is Delaware. I have never flown into or out of Delaware with my guns and neither has anyone else in a long time. Do you know why? Delaware has no commercial airport. There you go. Likewise, I've never flown into or out of Washington DC because Washington DC has no commercial airport. The two airports, uh, Reagan National and uh, Dulles you know, IAD, those are both in Virginia. So that is totally allowed, though, in all of the states, including uh, New York, that have airports. You can do this. Uh, if you check with the FAA, if you check with the TSA, they will confirm this. 
they will have all the policies and everything I'm going to cover for you on the web. You know, you have to declare your firearm. It has to be locked, unloaded, you know, has to be properly secured. It is neat. They even specifically call out what constitutes a firearm. You notice they quote, uh, you know, they quote the uniform code, right? So U.S. code, it's, it's USC Title 18, et cetera, et cetera. The operable part, the pressure bearing part, the, the receiver, a bare receiver, they understand the FAA says like this luggage has no firearms in it. This luggage does. And I make a joke about this because if you are just trying to leverage the freedom to lock your, your luggage with proper hard-sided case, proper padlocks, which you can do, uh, you don't have to use TSA locks. They specifically say you're allowed to, but I often don't. I use very, very manipulation resistant, very ruggedized padlocks because I have other expensive things in my life. Uh, and if I want to protect those things, I'll sometimes just throw a bare receiver in one of my cases, right? It's fine. Uh, you know, the, the TSA also talks about this. The FAA talks about this. They'll talk about ammunition. We will get into ammunition later. Uh, you can't have anything beyond, you know, basically you can't have 20 millimeter. At that point, you're, you're basically a light weapon. You're a cannon, uh, which they say is 75 caliber, which is, do the math for me. That's wrong. Uh, that's not 19 millimeter. But anyway, uh, anything bigger than that, except shotgun shells, which are considered sporting, those are allowed. And yeah, I, uh, I can point you to a bunch of links. Notice I love this one specifically, loaded, quote unquote, loaded magazines are okay as long as they are not in the firearm. You can use magazines as a way to store your, your ammunition because you can fly with ammunition because they even say, you know, whether your mag is loaded or empty. Now we'll get into how that magazine should be handled, but they basically have to be secure. They can't be you can't have exposed rounds. Uh, the TSA has historically interpreted this to mean if I just have a loose mag just knocking around, mm, they don't like that. If you slip it into a mag holster or you put that magazine into another container that will hold it snug, that's fine. One time I was in an airport and literally the TSA, I watched them putting their like TSA tape just like over someone's magazine so they didn't, they didn't want the, that top round exposed. Okay. But I've been giving you just sort of a shot in the dark here about, well, here's the website and the information's out there and here's what they say, but what are the actual basics? How could I break it down for you? Well, it's like this. In case this was somehow unclear, this is checked luggage. Uh, you are probably not a sworn law enforcement officer with a mission specific duty to have your firearm in the plane cabin. Therefore, this is not carry on luggage. You're not going through passenger screening with your gun. You don't go anywhere near passenger screening with your gun. This is in your checked bag. Uh, there once was a time that you could, you know, have your, this was a carry-on pistol bag. Uh, that is, that is absolutely a Delta bag tag from the mid sixties. I would, given that little widget logo, it's between 62 and 68. Uh, but yeah, this was, this was not something you can do anymore. Nowadays, when you have your checked luggage, it has to be declared to the airline when you're checking in. So you say, you know, hello, I have a firearm. And you, of course, you know, let's be smart about it. You don't say, hi, I got a gun, like in the middle of an airport. So when you are checking your luggage with the airline, you say, you know, hello, I have three checked bags today. By the way, one of them contains a firearm. I'd like to declare a firearm. Using neutral language like that, you're unlikely to make the airline freak out. Uh, you might be just in a part of the world where guns are not common. Again, New York City has been an odd case for me. They kind of, huh? They, they really give you a double take and they immediately stop the process in New York and they call like the Port Authority over just to make sure that you're in compliance with any possible New York laws. For the most part though, nothing, nothing out of the ordinary. Oh, you're declaring a firearm today. Okay. Now, what counts as a firearm? In your checked bag, obviously regular conventional firearms, they're going to count, right? Like they expel, you know, defensive ammunition, a lethal projectile, gunpowder's involved. That is the, clearly the definition of a firearm. What about a flare gun? A flare launcher expels a projectile. It's not meant to be lethal, but it definitely expels a projectile with a gunpowder charge. That is a firearm under the FAA's definition. Of, if you stick up a liquor store with a flare gun, I'm pretty sure gun laws apply. One thing about this, however, when flying, you can check a flare gun as a firearm. You cannot check flares. If you saw under the ammunition section on the TSA and FAA website, right? Flares are flammable, they're hazardous goods, they are not conventional small arms ammunition. Likewise, loose propellant. Maybe you do a lot of flintlock stuff and old time black powder, or, you know, cowboy shooting. You can't pack loose propellant in your luggage. Propellant is allowed if it is in pressed into encased rounds, proper factory cased rounds. 
do I have to tell anyone binary targets, right? Like you can't literally bring freaking explosives in your check bag. Uh, that's not in the spirit of the law. That is not, that's not okay. And you're laughing. You're like, why? I wouldn't bring intentional flammable crap. Well, a lot of us have cleaning products in our pistol bag, in our rifle bag, in our range bag. Look closely at your cleaning products, right? Some of them, first of all, are compressed. You can't bring compressed propellant of any kind, like a gas or a spray. Uh, some of them just literally, like the hops is going to say, highly flammable. Also, don't swallow this and blah. So what do I mean? I actually have CLP, that little, little break free. That's going to be in all my bags and my pistols and stuff because it's fl- you can fly with it, right? It's not flammable. It's not compressed. You just uh, can't swallow it. It's not fire clean. Can't cook your eggs with it. So we mentioned the flare guns, no flares. What else can you take? Well, in the vein of flare guns, this, this is getting a little silly, right? I, someone sent me this once, and it, to me, it's kind of hilarious. It's the smallest flare launcher I've ever seen. Uh, it's essentially like a zip gun. It's a little pen. It's for hikers. And the flares themselves, it doesn't even have a barrel. You screw a flare cartridge on the end, and you pull the little slider back and snap it, and it'll shoot a little pencil flare. I have personally flown with this. Like I've checked this in my bag and said I have to declare a firearm. I have gotten pushback. Uh, the airlines didn't quite understand. The TSA didn't understand it at all. They said, we've looked in your bag. Where's the firearm? And I took it out, and they went, really? Uh, so I don't try to do that anymore. But this gets into questions like, what about a CERT pistol, a laser training replica pistol? Uh, this is not a firearm at all, right? This doesn't take regular ammo. But if you look at this on a scanner, it's metal and polymer. Like it looks really firearmy. You would not take this ever, ever, ever through passenger screening in a carry-on bag. But if you try to check it, would they understand that it's not really a firearm? Would they, what would they think? What would they think about my taser shotgun? Legally, this is not a firearm, but you better believe I declare it, right? No one would ever understand how this isn't like, this must be a firearm. Look at it. Uh, Clearly, This is getting into the idea that what matters the most isn't the exact letter of the law in every situation. It's what the situation is in the mind of the person you're interacting with. Uh, This gets into things like airsoft gear, right? Again, if you don't declare it and they see it on the scanner, you might get a weird stern talking to. TSA might pull your bag and say, whose bag is this? There's a firearm in there. And you have to say, no, it's not. It's a little spring gun. Uh, but again, like, what if you do try to declare it and use that as, as a way to lock your luggage? You say, I really want to lock my bags because I don't want anything stolen. I'm going to throw an airsoft in there. You might get a situation where someone says, come on, pal, I see the orange tip. What is this? They're doing a hand scan. They're like, you can't have locks on this bag, sir. This isn't a firearm. Uh, you, this can get, us, get really silly, right? You could have blue guns, like rubber guns, trainer guns. Again, you would never, ever, ever try to take these through security in your carry-on. Of course, they're just rubber. The standard for what you're not allowed to take through passenger screening is a very low standard. That's a low bar. The standard for what counts as a firearm is a higher bar. These are different standards, and be mindful of that when packing. This, again, gets into the funniest one, I think, is the, the bear receiver, right? Legally, this is very much a firearm. Um, in the F, the, like again, the ATF, if you try to transfer this to someone out of state and like, you can't just give it to your friend, like you have to do a proper like FFL transfer. It's a firearm, but the TSA often will not understand this. And the fact that this one is super cheap, this one's polymer. I literally bought it just because again, I had a bunch of cases of work equipment and I wanted to lock them all up. So I threw the cheapest polymer receiver I could in one of the cases and the TSA like kept running it through their scanner and looking and looking at their screen eventually came over to me. They're like, we can't find the firearm. You said there's a firearm here. It's not in here. And I said, no, it's in there. And eventually I had to make them unlock it and take it out. And I pointed, I said, that plastic bag. And the guy, it was like in a Ziploc baggie. This guy looks at it and he's what? And thank goodness some other TSA guy was like a former cop or military. He was like, oh no, that's a receiver. Oh yeah, that's a firearm. But again, like your mileage may vary given who you're talking to. Gun parts. So feeding devices, springs, now nothing that's a gun part can go through passenger screening. Even a firearm, like part as small as a shotgun choke, which is essentially just a little ring of metal, right? Cannot have that in passenger screening in your check in your carry-on. But in your checked bag, you don't automatically get all the auspices of like locking your luggage. I knew somebody who used to just throw a magazine in, again, because he just wanted to lock his luggage. 
And sometimes that didn't work out for them. Sometimes they would cut the locks. They wouldn't understand. They'd say, no, it only counts if it's a real firearm, which again, we want to get into weirdness like NFA rules are weird, right? A suppressor under the National Firearms Act, a suppressor is a firearm. Do you expect that the TSA or your airline or everyone will understand this all the time? No, probably not. Likewise, things like NFA paperwork. Um, technically, suppressors and AOWs, you don't need any paperwork to, to move between states. But anything short-barreled, or like here, we got a case of full-auto M16s, any destructive devices, uh, you got to fill out a dot .20, right? You've got a 53 2020. Uh, you have to apply for an exemption to move your fire, your NFA items between states. I have never in my life had an airport worker of any kind, uh, airline staff, TSA. I've never had anyone or known of anyone to ask about a Form.20 or anything like that for NFA gear. They, again, they all just want to see something that looks fire army and is it declared correctly and is it locked correctly? So what about declarations, right? Well, you have to declare that it is unloaded and it's not always verbal. Almost every air carrier, I think everyone that I know of nowadays, makes you declare in writing. And it's a little card. You get a little, a little orange card on the back of it. There's a written statement. You sign it, you date it. Okay, you put it in your luggage. These declaration cards, you know, they, they sometimes have carbon copy layers. Every airline is a little different, but it's roughly the same deal. Expect to be handed one of these cards for each gun case. Each case needs one in it. And you fill it out, okay, goes in. Now, speaking of gun case, what are you using as a gun case, right? Your lockable hard-sided case, which is the standard, that's the law, that's the policy, that can be a very large case. It could be your luggage itself, which contains many things, including your firearm. It also has your clothes, your socks, your laptop. I like to do that uh, because I like to protect all of my belongings with heavy padlocks. Or you could just have a tiny, you know, little piece of Tupperware, right? You got your little Glock Tupperware. That's a hard-sided case. You could technically throw a lock through that handle, but you run into this kind of risk. If you have a small lockable container and it's locked and it's inside of a larger container, the TSA will say, well, the small locked container satisfies the requirement. The locks on the outside of your container are then expendable. If the TSA wants to get in there, they might cut them, they might not call you. So if you have a smaller container, which I always have just a small range bag, a little soft-sided range bag, that is always inside of my case. And this is not lockable or hard-sided. So I have to put my locks on the outside of the luggage, which is what I want to always do. Be aware, your luggage will be subject to regular airline policies. So we've got dimensionality requirements, size requirements, weight requirements. Uh, if you're a frequent flyer like me, maybe you get extra bags, maybe you get extra weight. If you're not, be ready to you know, break out the credit card at the airport if your case is super big, super long. Speaking of a super big and long case like we see here, this is not common anymore. Some airports might still do this. I remember back in the day, it was very typical for them, the airline worker, to say, all right, I have to verify that it's unloaded. Can I see that it's unloaded, please? Or can I see how it's packed? and you would uncase the firearm right there at check-in. Uh, I've racked slides open, I've shown chambers. This is, again, it's not common anymore because there's a lot of reasons. First of all, any unnecessary administrative handling of a firearm is an opportunity for something to go wrong. Uh, it's an opportunity for people around you to freak out, to not understand what's happening. You could drop it, damage it. You could also maybe actually have a loaded firearm and have a negligent discharge. Like it's happened in airports. The airlines have pretty much all taken the stance that if you're going to accidentally have a loaded firearm, they would rather that be the TSA's problem. Let the TSA catch it when they check your luggage. The airline doesn't want to know anything about it other than you said it was unloaded. So that's not typical anymore. What is still typical is your airline carrier will likely enroll your luggage in the system in a unique manner. It'll flag your luggage. You know, there's this, in, I don't know, in Delta in their Snap software, like you go to bag screen, select bag conditions, firearm, and it'll walk them through even a script. They ask you questions. Is it unloaded? Is it locked? Et cetera, et cetera. So this is, this is not something you'll be strange about seeing. Like sometimes on your tickets or somewhere in your paperwork, oh, you have a firearm. It's in your records, so to speak, with the airline. Now, is that record supposed to be anything on the outside of the case? No. Again, this has changed over time. Uh, this kind of tag, which is really obvious, SAS Airlines, 
This should not go on the outside of your bag. Nothing like this. Those little orange tags that I showed you, the declaration forms, they used to look like little tags. They had string on them. Um, that is no longer the case. Airlines are not supposed to mark the outside of your luggage in any way, saying firearm. Now, does that mean they don't say anything about it? I mean, they do. So special designations such as CAGPT or a Delta speak that is check and give protection to, uh, that is a tag that gets spit out of the machine when I'm checking my luggage and they code it as firearm. So they put a second bag tag on there. Sometimes it's a sticker, sometimes it's tape. Uh, it always kind of annoys me when, you know, like this is, I know you're not supposed to mark firearm on the outside, but what else do you think is in there? A freaking expensive saxophone, the freaking glass flute that everyone was losing their minds about on the news. No, like that's obviously a firearm, but it's not violating the law because it doesn't use the word firearm. Um, just one of those things. So we've talked about your locked hard-sided case. We've talked about the gun goes inside, gets declared, and then it's the TSA's problem. Well, what does the TSA do? Well, they will screen your bag with their customary levels of competence or incompetence. Now, there are different ways that your luggage containing a gun can be screened. It depends mostly just on the airport and how airports are laid out. And there are different scenarios I'll talk you through, right? The best kind of scenario is directly in front of you, like right there in the check-in hall or an adjacent room, like kind of nearby where the TSA is going to perform the screening and you yourself have like, maybe with an airline worker, maybe by yourself, you've taken your bags to that place. Sometimes they are using an inline scanner and they just send it through the tunnel. They look at their screen. Ah, it looks pretty good. Thumbs up. Sometimes they just do a swab on the outside or a swab a little bit around the inside. Sometimes you get the full rotor rooter, you know, freedom fondle of all your possessions and they take everything out and they paw through it. But again, I don't like it. At least it's happening in front of me. And I can interact with them. I can say, no, that's that's a laptop. Please don't pack that like that. Hey, no, the, that's the gun. You're handling the gun now, sir. Um, so yeah, I like being able to interact and, and observe like how they're doing things. Here is a good note for you. The finger check. What is the finger check? No, I'm not talking about passenger screening. Uh, that's a different kind of finger check. We're talking about if your luggage is locked, the hard-sided case, whether it's a tiny case, a big case, if you pop all the latches and like unsnap those, but the locks are still on, it shouldn't be possible for anyone to get a finger inside, like the crack of the luggage lid. Um, this, this is sometimes, I like to make a DMV example. Like if you're getting your driver's license test, uh, does, does anybody even, do they do parallel parking anymore? That was a thing when I was growing up, right? Just remember that? Like you had to learn how to do stick shift and parallel park. I don't know if that's a thing anymore. But driver test instructors would sometimes they have a long line of candidates and they'd say, we're trying parallel parking first. Because if you bungle it, right, you hit the cones, get out of the car, try again next, next week. They don't have to go on the whole road course. Same thing with the finger check. Some very dedicated TSA people will do the finger check right away because if your luggage is going to fail, they want to know that and they want to tell you, hey, sorry, this, this ain't flying today. Figure it out. Uh, so I, I actually understand this. There's a logic to that. If your case does have the latches popped open, either through mishandling or through mischief or just through accident, you don't want your gun accessible. You don't want ammo falling out of this case. I, I get it. One thing I learned, uh, I learned it under pressure. I'm glad I figured it out, though. These little cable style luggage locks, they're very popular, uh, even though they are TSA keyed, which makes them not as secure, in my opinion. Uh, they will work, right? That you can you can put these on hard sided cases. The TSA will accept them as a fine, sure it's a lock, but they will not hold a Pelican case closed enough to satisfy the finger check for very diligent screeners. I have these locks as a backup. I was on a trip. I was traveling with so many guns that I had to like buy another case, and I, I picked up some guns at another location, and I realized I was like, oh crap, I don't have locks. So I had these little rinky dink locks. And I just threw them on. I'm like, all right, all right. I'm going to get that last last case. Just get it home. Deal with it when I get home. And the TSA screener, I mean, she did a finger check. She's like, this case ain't going to work. No, nope, this one, th these locks aren't going to work for you. And thank goodness, I was like, well, here's a shot in the dark. And I just did this. I had to really stick it, like pull it really hard. But I was able to pull this cable all the way through and just barely get it to click shut. And damn, it certainly passed the finger test. It was the tightest lock I'd ever seen. So if you're ever in a jam, these little cable locks can be leveraged sometimes. 
Um, what else about the TSA can be weird? So sometimes they will just touch your guns. They're technically not supposed to. Uh, they're supposed to acknowledge, okay, this is a firearm, but sometimes they'll just dive right in. And all I can ever do is document as best I can. Uh, the rule, if you're curious, during a hand scan uh, is any item big enough to contain a soda can should be inspected. So any container, any zipper pouch, uh, they, they're allowed, you know, they'll go through your sundry kit or whatever. Um, they sometimes don't if it's see-through. So like mesh packing cubes, I'm a big fan of packing cubes. Sometimes they won't go through that. But small gun bags or holsters or anything that's holding the gun is usually exempt from that direct hand inspection. But again, your mileage may vary. Sometimes they just dive right in there and all right, I'm just going to document, get to, get some names. Hopefully they don't break anything. Sometimes they act very surprised by your firearms. Like this guy's shocked face. Like you're opening a large locked Pelican case with an orange declaration card after I've said I'm flying with firearms. And he took this green zipper bag and was like, whoa, there's a gun in here. I'm like, yeah, you found it. Well, bang up job, sport. Uh, sometimes they act afraid of your firearms. Like this woman was doing a screening and she got to the gun and figured out, oh, this is the gun. And then she just walked away and started getting on her phone. And she had her supervisor come over. The STSO with the three stripes is the one who checked the gun case. Yeah, okay, this is a gun. There's nothing hidden under the styrofoam, whatever. Uh, maybe she wasn't uh, trained to do firearm screening. I don't know, but that was weird. Also, something that your mileage may vary, re-securing the firearms, like putting things away. If you're right in front of the TSA, sometimes they will ask for your help. Sometimes they'll just ask your advice. They'll say, remind me, which side of the bag did you have this on? And other times they'll just spin the case around. They're like, do you want to pack it back up? You know how everything goes. Sometimes if you try to reach for your luggage, though, they'll freak out. They're like, no, you can't touch that. Uh, yeah, I can't. You can't touch anything. Sometimes There's actually a rule that one uh, supervisor told me about sleeves. I had short sleeves on one day. He was like, do you want to lock this up? If you, you know where everything goes, it's okay. I, I can see your arms. I was like, okay, we're doing no sleight of hand. I don't have a bomb up my sleeves, I guess. Okay. But again, ask them what they want. You say, would you like help with that? I'm happy to, you know, I can tell you, you can even say, I can tell you where things go. And that's a little toe in the water. They might say, yeah, please help me. Or they might say, yeah, you go ahead and do it. Or they might say, get the frick out of here. I know how to do things, buddy. But again, at least I'm interacting with the TSA. And that's, that's really big for me. So you'll have other scenarios where your interaction is limited, okay? So what about this? Maybe you've done this before. Maybe some of you have flown with firearms and the screening area is near you, but you're not observing what's happening. It's a little ways away. It's behind a little rope or behind a magic line on the floor that they say, oh, you can't go, can't go past that line. But you can at least observe a little bit of what's going on. You can see if someone's being a complete jack wagon. If they're trying to cram your bag and smash the lid down, you can be like, hey, hey, excuse me, please. Yeah, that's not where that goes. Um, and so, you know, some airports are like this. Other airports, we're getting less and less ideal as we go. Some airports, your bag screening is taking place in another room, but it's like nearby. The TSA knows you're there at the very least. Sometimes they're on the other side of glass. Sometimes they're behind a big rubber curtain. You know, your bag goes on a little two foot belt that just takes it on the other side of a wall. And the airline workers like, hey, we got a firearm here. And the TSA goes, OK. And they know that you're there. So if they need to get in the case, they will invariably come to you. They know you're standing right there. Hey, can I have a key, please? You can get a name. This is OK. It's, it's less ideal, but at least you're not likely to have a complete disaster. Now. Getting to these other locations, we're getting further and further away from like the check-in counter. Sometimes it's an airport staff member who takes you. Sometimes they have to quote escort you, which seems funny to me. Sometimes it's an airport porter. Maybe they like have to say, oh, we're going really far. We got to go down this elevator thing. And they have like a cart. Okay. Sometimes they'll call ahead to try to make sure someone's there. In the event that you're on your own, I'm a big fan of, again, Pelican case because they have wheels. If I have to traipse through a whole airport. It's easier than, you know, humping this thing up and down stairs or up and down an escalator. What do you know? I got wheels. If you have a lot of luggage and it's all full of guns and you got one of those luggage carts that you paid your five bucks for, don't surrender the cart right away as you're checking in because maybe they're going to say, oh, well, okay, you actually, now you got your guns. These two cases, take the gun cases uh, down to this hall and to the left and it's a door on the right side and that's where the screening area is. You'll see it. Okay, I'm glad I didn't get rid of my cart. But these are all scenarios where I personally am like taking my guns 
to the spot, either right there at the check-in hall or down, down a ways, or I've gone to other floors, but I'm the one doing it. There's one more scenario, and it's unfortunately common in a lot of airports, and it is the least desirable. The least desirable scenario is when they put your bags on the belt, the regular belt, and your, bag, your locked up gun case just zips back through, through a hole, and they say something to you like, all right, just wait about 10 minutes, and we'll page you. If, if we don't hear from you in 10 minutes, like you don't hear from us, you're good. Mm -mm 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 -mm. No, 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 no. This is the recipe for trouble. Uh, on many occasions, screening is smooth. Your luggage will not need to be open. I have had occasions when the TSA wants to see the inside. They want to unlock it, but there's a communication breakdown. Now, maybe that's because they don't know I'm waiting there. Maybe they don't have a means to contact the ticket counter. They say, oh, they'll page you. But then you, you talk to the TSA, they're like, no, we don't have any way to freaking page. We don't have a paging system. I don't know what they told you that for. Or maybe they're just dicks. They don't want to page me. They're busy. They, they just, boom, we're going to cut those locks off. I've had locks cut. Uh, these are crappy master locks. Those are not the locks that were on my gun case when I left my origin city. When I got to Seattle, I pulled it off the belt. I went, what the frig is this? Uh, so I thankfully I had picks on me. So I zipped the locks like right off. I'm like, what? I like, threw these things away. And I looked in my luggage. And inside my luggage were my real locks, which had been snipped. This has happened to me in a number of places. Uh, these, again, not my locks. Uh, I've had these locks cut off. They threw like dial combination locks on there. So I had to shim these to get them open. Sometimes they won't throw locks on there because they can't send a gun case unlocked. That's why they're throwing shitty locks on there. But sometimes they're like, here, friggin' take a zip tie. Who gives a damn? Screw you. So yeah, like this is, I've seen this before. I've seen attempts at cutting of locks. So this is funny. You can actually see the bite marks on the shackle. And yeah, they didn't get in there, but the gun case still went. Uh, I don't know how that one happened. I would expect that this, my friend, uh, this is my friend's case and he just got really lucky. Here's a friend of mine who got less lucky. So this friend, he had a locked case. He got it off. You know, he, he didn't get paged. He got to his destination, got his, got it to the hotel room. And when he opened it, he was like, what the hell is this? How is there an inspection notice in here? The locks were there, though nothing was cut. He looked and he saw, oh, okay, they cracked the plastic and they pounded the hinge pins out of the other side of this little tiny you know, case that he was using. The TSA has a lot of tools for getting into locks and locks luggage. They have all kind of hammers and mallets and punches and I've seen their whole toolkit. They love to use it. So we wanna prevent this from happening to us, especially in that last scenario of you declared the firearm, you put the card in, you locked it, you sent it down the belt and they said, oh, just wait 10 minutes. You're probably good. So no, 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 no. Best ways to prevent problems. One, keeping your contact information up to date and on the case, right? If there's a phone number on the outside of your bag, like it should be the phone you are carrying. It should be your cell phone. Uh, this doesn't always help. I've seen it ignored, but it can't hurt. So I have these little card holders on multiple sides of my Pelican cases. The bigger thing though, and this is really where let, let my... My, my problems be not your problems and learn from this. The biggest thing you can do is don't dismiss yourself. Those scenarios where, oh, just wait 10 minutes, uh, that directive, no, no, no. You wait the 10 minutes, and then after that, you go back up to the counter, and they'll be surprised to see you. Sometimes they'll be like, oh, no, you're, you're good, sir. My, why, no, ma'am, your gun should be, you didn't page you, did you? you? It's been more than 10 minutes, right? You're fine. No, 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 no. You are going to make yourself a a presence that is known and you say, no, excuse me, but um, that's not what I was instructed to do or that's not how my company does it. You can spin your own words. I use and sometimes say, that's not the policy of my department. I didn't say I'm a cop. I'm definitely not saying I'm, a, I'm not a cop, but they hear the word department and someone says, oh, well, all right, let me, what is this? Someone works for a department. They must have policies and oh, what's, what's your policy? And I say, I'm not dismissed until we have positive confirmation that my gun case has cleared. I've had locks cut in the past. Uh, now, again, this might be hard for you. People don't like confrontation. And it might seem like a challenge if there's a crowd and, oh, there's this line. I want to wait through the line. I won't wait through. I'll walk right up. And I'll say, oh, because you know, I got the name. Like, hi, hi there, Chris, Samantha, Gary, whomever. Uh, so that's been 10 minutes. And there's a line. And they're like, oh, well, if it's been 10 minutes, you're good. I'm going to service the next customer. I say, no, no. Um, let's go ahead and make sure the luggage is cleared. I am not dismissed until we know my gun case has cleared properly. Can you get TSA on the line? Can you call the bag room? Can you call anyone? And just generally be what I call a politely persistent problem and make it clear that you're not getting out of their hair 
until they figure it out. They're like, well, that's not what we do here. Well, guess what? It's what you do here today. And if more of us would do this, more airlines would get in the habit of figuring out that they have to be able to give us some confirmation. So this can be a little hassle. It's rare. Again, I want to be clear. It's very rare that things go sideways. But I'm always prepared to wait the extra few minutes to say, well, why don't you figure out who to call? Why don't you get your supervisor on the phone? And I'm taking up space. I'm just holding space in their lane, waiting for them to deal with this. Regarding waiting, by the way, you should also be prepared that sometimes it's super smooth, but there are times when I've been, okay, take your bag to the TSA room. And this guy just wheeled my case over here, but the TSA like wasn't there. And they're trying to get on the phone and get a TSA person to come down to the special screening area for my bag. So sometimes that adds a few minutes, but in general, just be that persistent problem and offer them solutions. I'm going to give you a script of some solutions. First of all, you might learn your home airport better than the airline, right? The airline might, you might be dealing with a brand new person at the airline who doesn't know all the people who got the problem solving. You, if you're ever in your airport and you see things like phone numbers, right? If you always fly into or out of certain airports, you know how many airport phone lines I know better than half the airport workers? How many times there's like a piece of paper on the counter and I'll just take a little cell phone snap. You can spin this around in Photoshop. There you go. There's the bag room. There's the operations desk. There's a ramp room. Like I can say, oh, call this extension. Why don't you, do, you know, check with this person. Can you call the bag room? Can you call the TSA ops? Here's the number. The big one though for me, and I find this really helpful, is modern luggage tracking systems. So many of you may fly regularly enough that you have like the frequent flyer app on your phone. Uh, heaven knows I do. My wife and I are both diamond on Delta. We get all our, you know, we deal with the, the phone notifying us of our gate and our thing and our, your luggage is on the plane. Your luggage is off the plane. You get those, right? Those little alerts happen at certain scanning points throughout the baggage network. So there's scanners, there's 900 megahertz tag scanners. That's if you're curious what Delta uses, it's UHF tags. Um, they're built into the, um, to the ramp systems. They're, they're little scanner guns, almost like little UPS delivery driver kind of barcode scanners. At various points in the process, your luggage is registering, okay, it's on the plane, it's off the plane. But those alerts that you get, those are not the only data points in the system. You're getting a very tailored small slice of the baggage network alerts. So if you've ever had luggage lost, and you like this is me in a lost luggage office, and I'm dealing with uh, one of the Delta irregular ops staff. They were able to get really granular and say, okay, this is exactly the last flight it was on, then it was taken off, then it was moved here, then it was moved to checkpoint this, and it's in this luggage cart here. It's probably in holding bin seven. Let me get that person on the phone. Okay, I'm talking to them. They're going to put it on the next plane. So this information is available to airport workers. I have regularly asked at the counter, they say, can you call the TSA? And they say, no, I can't call the TSA. I say, okay, well, if you can't call the TSA, you're, you just claim that they don't have telephones in the bag room. Can you log into SNAP? Can you look in the tracking system? Or actually, in this case, you had to go into Delta term. And I say, tell me where the case is. Is it out at the pier? Is it in the hands of rampers, right? If your luggage has made it out that far and it's prepped to be loaded on the plane as it gets closer to your flight, it has cleared the TSA, right? You can be pretty confident that, okay, they didn't need to get into it. Or if they sometimes they're tap, 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 tap. I mean, that's weird. So I'm seeing the intake scans. I saw the rent, the bags, the belt. No, there's, this is something's up. And then that, that's a little poke in their butt to say, let me get someone on the phone. Let me call ops. Let me call somebody. And eventually miracle of miracles, they find a way to get on the phone and get a TSA person and say, oh, oh yeah, you're down there with that big green Pelican case. Oh yeah, the customer's up here. Yeah, we got, oh, you need the key? Oh, okay. And sometimes I get invited to really interesting places. This is down in a maintenance, you know, sub-level of the airport because my bag was sitting there and they figured out where it was. And just by generally being a sort of polite nuisance, I found out it wasn't cleared and somebody walked me down there and said, okay, let's get this. Oh, it was okay, your laptop, the battery, the laptop. Okay, we're skating, you're good, good. Uh, sometimes TSA will come out and ask you for the key. Um, if it's not right in front of you, you know, hey, you can't come back to where it is, but can I get the key? Try to get a name. You know, that's my, that's my general rule. Just try to get names. If you ever, you know, it seems a little annoying, but just try to get names, take notes. I take a little notes on my phone and I just say, them. it's fine. Sometimes the airline worker will come out and say, oh, the TSA said, yeah, we need a key. This was a ton of equipment. Obviously we had all different gun cases and all kinds of things we were doing. 
And this one red coat said, hey, did you check uh, the green case earlier? Yeah, they need the key for that. And I say, okay, well, Lori, well, do me a favor. Try to get a name for her. Because again, they want to shift liability off themselves. Said, oh, okay, I'll get a name of who I talk to. You'd be surprised. She comes back 10 minutes later. Here you go. Frank was the guy, if you're curious. And I watched him repack it. He did a pretty good job. Cool. It's all about little things that I do to enhance my peace of mind. And peace of mind, in my, in my opinion, is worth the extra effort, right? Every time I look out the window and I see my luggage getting loaded onto the plane and I see those little padlocks hanging off the side of my case, I know no one's been in there. I know the locks aren't cut, the guns are fine, the laptop's fine, the liquor is fine, everything else that I'm flying with is fine. And I get to have a nice flight, right? So then you enjoy your flight. Hooray, good gerb, awesome. What happens when you land? Okay. Well, let's talk about that. Let's talk about affairs at the destination. Claiming your luggage. This can be different depending on your airport. Um, sometimes, this is not common anymore for me because I fly Delta exclusively, but sometimes your luggage will just come right out on the baggage belt. Okay, get, get your butt down there. Be ready for it because your, your luggage will look very conspicuous. Like it's clearly a hard case. It's got locks on it. If somebody wants to steal luggage, that's the kind of thing they might target. I've had a gun case almost stolen in an airport back in Philly. Uh, there's a whole different story. You can ask me during the Q&A. Sometimes because your case is maybe big or weird or long rifle case, it might come out on an oversized belt or a special belt. This is where it helps if you have people in your party traveling with you, or if you can keep one eye in multiple places looking at one belt, looking at the other. Those oversized special delivery areas, those are sometimes in a weird place. Sometimes they're way off at the end of the room, like the end of the baggage hall, like a roll-up door. Sometimes it doesn't come out on a belt at all. Sometimes it's just literally an airport ramper who comes up with a cart and is like, all right, this last flight that just came in from Wyoming, like all six of you, I got six gun cases. Here they are. And you know, here, here's yours, here's yours, here's yours. Okay, there you go. Sometimes you won't see it anywhere at all. And this is increasingly typical for me. And I actually like this scenario the best. You might say, well, why? That seems scary. If you, you can't find your luggage, where did it go? More and more airlines are expressing a preference for keeping luggage in the baggage service office, not just throwing it out on a belt, but verifying a little bit who they hand it off to. So if you don't see your luggage anywhere and you're missing a gun case, check with the baggage office. It's very likely that's where things get delivered. And many times they ask to see an ID uh, I like that. I used to not like showing my ID, but it's like a little concierge service. They hold the bag until I get down there. So I could be up in the Sky Club. I could be getting a free meal or whatever I want before I come downstairs. And my bag is right there. Now, double-edged sword, that extra touch time when it's in their care, there's some extra silliness. Some of you who have, <laughs> who have read some articles that I've written and seen blog posts, some of you have probably encountered this. Shout out to the zip ties of freedom, right? So... Certain carriers, this started in, um, I think this was March of 2017, I want to say. This was just after that very horrible incident in, I think it was the Fort Lauderdale airport, where somebody flew to Florida, took a gun out of their bag right in the baggage hall, and there was a public spree shooting. Well, what did the air carriers do? They responded in arguably the silliest way possible. So this was the first time, this was literally the very first time I ever saw this. I'm waiting, I go to the baggage office. I say, I have a firearm, I'm here to pick it up. He said, oh yes, we have it right here. I can have them ready in just a second, he says about my luggage. He starts pulling these cases out and I'm just, you know, scrolling Twitter or something. And in my distracted idling on my phone, I hear the ratcheting sound of zip ties. And I look up, I'm like, what the hell's going on? And so, yeah, the airlines have started zip tying luggage before they give you their firearm. Uh, and, and I'm like, what are you doing? He's like, oh, well, we can't give you an unlocked case. I'm like, clearly it's a locked case. I flew with it locked. They said, no, 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 we have to lock it again before we give it to you. And it's completely pointless, obviously. Um, most of the air carrier like staff hates this. Everyone says like at Austin Airport, someone said, oh God, we all hate this. Isn't this stupid? Minneapolis, someone said, God, I heard they're getting rid of this policy. I hope so. Someone else said Seattle was like, this is pointless. Obviously, if they had talked to anyone who works at an airline, like this is dumb. Uh, this is made up by someone who in an office, like again, like look at this, they're zip tying a soldier's duffel bag. This was in Raleigh, I think. And they were like, yeah, everyone hates these stupid zip ties. And, and it's really funny to me how lackadaisical the effort has become. So the zip ties have gotten tinier and tinier. 
And sometimes they're not even lockable. Like, what do you have to lock the case? Like, they're not lockable. They're these little quick release zip ties. You push this little knob, and you push the little nub, and it opens. Uh, or they do this, like literally, like I'm pretty sure I could snap this off with my fingers. So yeah, you may encounter this. Uh, that's what's going on. It is still happening on Delta in some airports. Some airports have just stopped. It's a real hit or miss for me nowadays. But whatever I do have a zip tie on my bag, even the big thick ones when they sometimes use them. On my carry-on bag, I always have medical shears and with my little IFAC kit. And med shears make short work of that, right? So right there, it's funny. They put the zip tie on. I cut the zip tie off and I throw them away. Like it's right there in front of the baggage office. Sometimes they don't like that, but what are you going to do? It's not the law. Like, why, why are you doing this? This is silly. So of course, now I have a little gallery of zip ties just on the floor and just all over the place in the trash. It's something we have to live with. I recommend you keep a tiny, you know, pair of scissors, which scissors are allowed in carry on uh, four inches from fulcrum to tip, no sharp points and a scissors are totally okay. So have a little set maybe in your carry-on bag somewhere. Another note at your destination, keep this in mind, your locks are very visible. Now, this can be a good thing. Again, I have spoken about peace of mind. When I pick up my bag, I go, oh, nice, I see the locks on there, cool. I'm feeling, feeling good about that. It's like a little security seal. As long as I can see the locks, I know no one's been in my luggage. Do I want other people seeing these locks though? When you're taking that lift ride to wherever you're going, or you, you get to the hotel and you're checking in, sometimes my locks are no longer on my bags at that point because I don't want to call attention to myself. Now, am I breaking the law? Am I walking around a city with an unlocked firearm at that point? Check your local laws. Check how your locks are applied inside the bag. There's other things you can do. We'll, we'll talk about this in a minute, but it's all, it's all a different scenario in each case, and it's what's comfortable for you. I'm trying to give you a nice broad look at what goes right and sometimes what goes wrong. And you take all this knowledge and you, you know, you formulate your own plan. The most common thing that can go wrong, misrouted luggage, right? Lost luggage, lost bags. This happens. You take en- you do enough miles in the air. It's, you're going to have a misrouted bag and it usually just catches up with you later in the day or get, you know, a lot of times it'll get delivered by a courier uh, because I get the special, you know, foot rubbing treatment from, from my carriers. But yeah, like when a courier is dropping it off, I like the fact that my luggage had locks on it the whole time. Uh, Maybe it's a giant, you know, a weather thing hits and a bunch of flights get canceled and a bunch of bags are left all over the place. Does it call attention to the fact that you've got locks in your bag? No, it might, but I actually, I'd prefer my, I'd prefer my things locked as much as I can keep them locked. That's generally my philosophy. Now, you might have damage. You might have your locks ripped off like this. Is this the sign of somebody trying to steal my guns? Probably not. It's the sign of a baggage handler who like grabbed the padlock and just tried to use it as a handle. It will happen over time if you put enough miles in. Pelican has a really nice warranty. I've swapped Pelican cases out before and they just, you know, they'll ship me a new one. I've had weird things on, again, like I've had a firearm that was packed with a magazine next to it and the magazine had ammo in it. And at my destination, the ammo was gone. Not like removed, but like gone. Uh, and I was like, what the hell is that? You know, that you can file a claim. You have cut locks, you have weird tampering or weird things, file a claim, a TSA. You know, it might take a long time for them to respond to it, but I've had six, eight, 10 months later, get a check in the mail. Yep, we shouldn't have cut your locks. You had names of who you spoke to at this airport, that airport, they gave you bad information. Sorry, we did that. Here's a check to replace those locks we cut. Be aware, insurance is a thing. I've talked about this with the firearm storage talk as well, right? We talked about my gun safes uh, lecture. So regular airline like policies don't cover special items. They don't cover high value items. If you have a like a high value gun destroyed or lost or stolen or something in your bag, the airline is probably going to tell you to go pound sand because they're only responsible for certain amounts of, of you know, monetary compensation. And, and that firearm probably ain't in that amount. You can get special insurance. Uh, Valuable personal property is usually what you'll look into because homeowner's insurance, renter's insurance, they might cover some things. Valuable personal property is something I recommend everyone look into. It it was a couple hundo for me for the year. And the hardest part of that process was that my wife and I had to take out literally all the freaking guns in our world and get all of them lined up and categorized and serial check, write them all down and, and submit this to USAA. But 
if anything ever really goes pear-shaped when I'm flying, I'm covered. I'm covered from a third-party carrier. One last bit of oddness we will discuss, and then uh, I'll give you some pointers, and we'll do some Q&A. Keep in mind, I started off by saying at the beginning, when you're enrolled in the system as a passenger and your luggage gets logged in and checked in and gets a tag, it will usually get marked or flagged as firearm. That can have implications for the rest of your journey on that itinerary. So if you're making the next leg, like you're coming home, for example, on a round trip, or you're making a multi-city hop, if you go to check in, a lot of times checking in electronically, either via the website or the mobile app or a kiosk in the airport, that might not be allowed because you're flagged as, oh, you need to have an agent check the case in. They just assume that you're still flying with firearms on every leg of a journey once a firearm is declared. This doesn't really affect me because I always just go up to the, you know, the priority line and there's not too many people there and the red coat takes care of you, but maybe it impacts you. Maybe you're the kind of person who you're trying to use an upgrade certificate or you're trying to do a seat change and you can't do that until you're officially checked in. So you're on the phone and you're dealing with customer care and they say, I'm trying to check you in, man, but it's not uh, checking me in. Well, that's, that's why. Um, it's just a thing that I've learned to deal with if I'm in a really weird open jaw itinerary uh, that I expect to do tons of multi-city hopping. I go, oh yeah, shoot. I checked a firearm in back in Phoenix. And I'm, here I am six cities later and I still can't apply like an upgrade or I can't change, make an easy change. And eventually the diamond desk sorts me out, but just keep that in mind. So overall, what are the takeaways? What are my best recommended practices? Okay. Well, you mentioned your luggage has to be hard-sided, lockable luggage. I'm a, a big fan of Pelican or clones of Pelican case. There are plenty of other options out there. There's Hardig, there's Explorer, there's Amazon Basics, I'm sure makes a Pelican type kind of case. As long as you do the finger test, make sure it's not gonna be sneezed at, make sure maybe it has some wheels, get you to and from the airport. Speaking of long cases like this, by the way, dragging them around, here's another note. Be prepared, most airlines will have a rule that says locks must be applied on all areas designed to accept locks. You got a long Pelican. Uh, this is, looks like a 1740 or 1720 series case. It's got four hasps on it. You better have four padlocks or you better take your Dremel and cut one or two of those hasps off. Um, so yeah, what locks do I recommend? You've seen them in my photos. I use almost exclusively Abloy. It's a Finnish style of lock. It's very manipulation resistant. It's also very duplication resistant of the keys. Because again, if I'm giving my keys to strangers, I like knowing for sure that a stranger is not getting to like copy my key somehow, or uh, you might call me a little crazy and paranoid, but I like this. Uh, they are expensive. You know, even the little, the little ones, the three, two ones that I use on a lot of these, they're, they're like 45, 50 bucks. I think they've actually gone up to like 60 or $65. So maybe you like this more. The Abbas, Abbas 40, uh, 84, 30, uh, was this? The 8435. The Abbas 8435 is available. They're rekeyable, right? You can, you can rekey them, but they're not just rekeyable like, oh, I want to make sure they match. Look at these in a catalog here. If I check out CLK, look at some of the phrasing. You see Schlage, Schlage, Quickset, Sergeant, Yale, right? You can get these locks. You can order them in keyways and cores that match conventional door locks. So if you're someone who likes to have a really slim existence, you just want one key, right? Maybe you want your padlocks to match your house key and you only have to track one key, right? You can do that. Now, then you're giving your house key to the TSA every time they ask for it. I don't know if you want to do that. Um, you can also, you could Maison key them. You could master key them. So you have your house key could open them, but you also have a separate key that could open them. You give that key away. There's a lot of ways you can get into this. I have a video on my website all about this lock. Um, I use it all the time. And the way, like at our house and our deadbolt, we have Schlage Primus. It's a very high security deadbolt. Now, my Primus key will work all of our little Abbas padlocks, but I don't have to give someone a Primus key. I can just use a regular hardware store Schlage key. It works in the padlocks. It doesn't work in our house. So we use this when we go biking, when we go rafting, whenever we need to lock something up when we're swimming in the Puget Sound or whatever. I don't have to have my super tip top valuable key on me or I lose it. It might be a solution for you. If you have more questions about that, please just ask me about it. If you have a lot of guns, I know many of you do, right? Airline policies can vary. Technically, the FAA does not have a hard limit as far as I've ever seen. You can pack whatever you want to pack. 
airlines sometimes do. So read your airlines, you know, firearms page. They might say maximum of five guns or maximum of three guns and four optics or something. This is just liability limitation, which is silly because again, I told you they're not responsible financially if they lose your bag. But for whatever reason, some people like I have flown with more guns than some people own all in one Pelican case. So the airlines aren't really always checking that. So that kind of thing. I think Delta used to have language about that. I don't think they do anymore. You don't want to be that person who's in the airport, though, trying to get to a match and you've got six guns here and two. And they say, oh, no, we can't. You can't take this. What now? Now your car is gone. You're standing there in the airport with guns. You got to be somewhere. Plan ahead. Another thing about planning ahead, ammunition. Another thing that can vary by air carrier in terms of policy and how they choose to interpret the policy, right? First of all, your limit on ammunition is 11 pounds. That's the FAA limit, 11 pounds of ammo. That's the cased ammunition. It's actually more generous than you think. Um, I did the math once. I, I just took out boxes of ammo on my little postage scale. You can get up to almost 250 rounds of like 308 before you hit 11 pounds. So depending on where you're going, what you're doing, you're unlikely to bump into that. Maybe, you know, maybe you're going to a two-gun match. Maybe you're going to a brutality match and you need like 200 rounds of 5.56, 200 rounds of 9 mil. You, you might be getting up there. Have I ever, ever in my life seen an airline care about weighing my ammo? No, never once in decades. If I wind up with a human who just really wants to though, they have a scale right there. I'm going to lose that argument if I have more than 11 pounds. So keep it in mind. The bigger thing, though, is how is the ammo stored? So the official policy, the FAA rules and most airlines specify they want the ammo not loose, but sometimes they even say they want separation of rounds, which is weird because if you're using a magazine, like the rounds aren't separate. They're in the freaking magazine, but neither here nor there. But if I have a box of ammo, like look at that little box of 22, it's got a little caddy in there and the, the rounds are all nice in a pretty little row. This is a different box of 22. If you bought Thunderbolt before, you know, there's no little caddy in there. They're just kind of thrown in there. I've had rifle ammo. Like I bought a box of 5.56 and it felt, you know, all right, this is a nice solid box, not, rat not rattling around. Just check it. If you're buying, you know, cheap Lake City or American Eagle surplus stuff, white box, it might just be all thrown in there. Uh, my recommendation, either get ammo that you can clearly see from the outside of the box. That's clearly all in a nice little row. It's all separated. Or get these storage cases, right? You get cases by Dylan or Plano or um, MTM is my go-to. I, I, you see all these blue cases are all MTM. They're super cheap. They're very rugged. So whenever I'm flying, my ammo is in cases like that. Or it's just in the magazine. Because again, Put it in the magazine. If you have like, um, you know, PMAGs, you get that dust cover, snap that on your PMAG. Those are encased. If you have pistol magazines, get really cheap nylon, like belt holsters, the cheapest ones ever that you would never use for carry or for matches. Slide it in, Velcro it shut. That mag is now contained. Something else that I do, you may have seen this in some of the photos, right? When I transport my ammo, there's this little extra box, this little metal box. Well, what is that box? It is a lock box. It is the worst lock imaginable. It's a complete turd ball lock, but I have the key on my keychain on my carry-on bag. Why would I use such a garbage product? It's to comply with various local laws. If I am, maybe I get off the plane in New Jersey. I now have a, 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 a piece of luggage that could have guns and ammo in it. And if you ever know New Jersey, like we're breaking the law. But if my ammunition is locked up separately than the firearm with a separate lock, passes the test. I mean, talk to your lawyers, obviously. I'm not your lawyer. I'm not going to tell you what is or isn't legal, especially in a place like New Jersey. Uh, I also do have a cable lock all the time in my, in my gun cases. Uh, I've talked about this before also about transporting firearms and storing firearms safely. So yeah, if I'm in a different jurisdiction where, I, again, I'll just throw this through the pistol. This is not suitable for like locking the gun in a soft-sided luggage. That This doesn't count. You have to have a hard-sided locked case but inside of my luggage, I'll have the pistol locked. I'll have the ammo locked if I'm going through New York or some other place that is very, very non-permissive. And if I'm staying at someone's house overnight and I have my luggage open and my pants and my shirts and everything, and maybe they have kids in the house, you, have a, you, have, you always have an extra way to be a good neighbor. That cart, hang on to that cart. Remember, uh, you don't know how far away you might have to go. If you paid for the cart, keep the cart. But the, the, real, the real big one 
is if it, you're not taking your stuff on a cart to a screening, if the screening is happening far away from you behind a wall, um, don't dismiss yourself until you have that confirmation. This really may be one of the most important points I can give you in this whole talk. If your luggage is somewhere in the back room, you don't just quote, wait 10 minutes and then leave. They will try so hard to get you to buzz off. Don't dismiss yourself, be persistent, be a polite problem. Push until you get confirmation, try to get names. You know, if you need to quote the rules, if someone from the TSA says, oh, you did this wrong, or I can't accept it, the airline says, no, you, this isn't, it has to be a small, tiny case, not a big case. I have a slick sheet. I literally have a two-sided sheet that I've laminated. It's in the bottom of my carry-on all the time. Uh, if you want it, here you go. I updated it just for this talk. That's the URL, but you don't have to write the whole thing down. The firearm section of the site has the legal help sheet there. Print it out, laminate it if you like. Mine, free, free, free for you to use. I have a few little sheets like that in my packs. I have a number of uh, things just to avoid arguments, to stand, on, stand my ground if I have to in certain encounters. Uh, and if you try this, this is also my request. Tell me how it goes. There is a whole section on my website called Air Traveler Accounts. It is hopelessly outdated. I have hundreds and hundreds of Air Traveler accounts, mostly my own, that I've written down and saved since 2017, 2016, and I just need to get them. If I got to hire somebody to do data input at one of these days. I've said this the last time I gave this talk, but you can read. You can read how an airline treated you, what the experience was like in that airport, what it was like at the destination, et cetera, et cetera. And just, just remember, bullshit like this is rare. Um, the New York City kind of thing, these are edge cases. Uh, if you, the, the edge cases can go bad, right? The nation is not kind to gun people in some respects. And if you don't know, like the Greg Ravel case, this was someone who was on an open itinerary. There was a weather delay. Instead of landing in Pennsylvania, they landed in Newark and he, had to, he couldn't get a flight till the next morning. And they declared, they said, the Port Authority said, no, well, you took possession of your case. The, the airline gave him his case. And he said, what the hell do I do? And they said, no, you had a gun in New Jersey and it wasn't part of your itinerary. And you know, so he spent a couple of days in jail and he had to fight a legal battle to get his gun back. And, but that is an edge, edge case, right? Follow the advice that I'm trying to give, document absolutely everything. And please, I don't want to end on a sad note. Uh, it's, a, it's really not that hard. You're going to have a good flight. Once you do it the first time, you might be nervous, but you're going to email me. You're going to say, you know what? It wasn't nearly as bad as I thought it was. This was great. I'm going to do it again and again. I've got you know, guns in this state. I've got to move them from my family's estate. I'm going to this gun match. Tell me about it. Tell me how it goes. I'm sure it'll be great. In general, I just want people to try this more. And uh, as always, I want you to stay safe out there. Well, thank you very much. Uh, we have some questions here, and I'll make sure to keep an eye out for chat now. And then we'll do some unmuting, and people can ask questions yeah. directly if they'd like. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so earlier you had mentioned the type of tool that you can carry with you to cut those zip ties. This happened mm -hmm. when uh, one of our members actually flew into the Upper Peninsula of Michigan mm -hmm. and then flew back home to, I think, Lauderdale, to, okay. strangely enough. Um, and you mentioned scissors, but what were the specifics with that? Oh, I am a huge fan. I wish I had a pair that I could show you right here. I'm a huge fan of folding scissors. Um, I will even try to drop a link like on Twitter when we're done all this. So uh, the Scissors, so if, if scissors are under four inches, not overall length, but from fulcrum to tip, that's fine. I might even have a set of med shears in here or something. But yeah, small scissors that are, man, I really wish I could show you the little folding set. There are scissors that are just for, like they loop up on themselves, they, they drop them in a little kit. But the reason I like them, they don't look like scissors on an x-ray. You're not doing anything illegal. You're not trying to hide the fact that you're like, artfully concealing a dangerous weapon, but minimizing your interaction with bureaucrats who don't understand the rules, always a good thing. So yeah, I keep a tiny set of folding scissors. Four inches from fulcrum to tip is fine. My, mine are much smaller than that. And you're unlikely to get a lot of static over having those. Excellent. Now someone asked what your <coughs> website was, and I was just going to throw it in chat for people because I'm, yeah, you've had it on the bottom of there we the go. presentation. Yeah. So and, and deviating.net, you will find me at deviating.net and you can find me you know, all over the various social medias and tell me how wrong I am about various opinions. That's what social media is for. <laughs> and he's also on Discord. So if we can throw that back out there to draw more people to Discord, that seems to be one of the happening places. Absolutely. 
my beloved wife also, uh, she just brought these in, said this is one example of those look like tiny glasses or something, but they are in fact uh, folding scissors, perfectly adequate to almost any task. Nice. Now you said that firearms that are NFA are treated by most airlines as just firearms, nothing special. It's just when you have to file the 5320.20 mm -hmm. with the um, ATF that it has additional complications. Is that correct? Yeah, that's, that's between you and the ATF. I've never been familiar with a situation where some, I know plenty of people who have title two gear and a bunch of NFA gear and you know, they're, they'll take it to a match or take it to a machine gun shoot. I've never known of them saying the airline wanted to like see that paperwork. The airline to them, a gun is a gun. Looks like a gun. Is it locked? Is it unloaded? I don't care about the rest of it. Excellent. You actually answered a nice chunk of the questions that people were asking, and I oh, had cool. just crossed them off as you were going. So very thorough. Thank awesome. you. Awesome. I wasn't watching the chat, so I'm glad it worked out that way. Well, and some of them were in Discord and some of them were direct message too. So mm -hmm. not all ended up in the Zoom chat. Thank you again. 